Okay, if I can have everyone um, quiet down, please. Thank you. And bring everyone in from the hallways, please. Thank you. Our final speaker for the morning is Cornelia Ferrara. She comes to us from Toronto. She holds a master's in science, and she's the author of various books exposing the New Age movement and feminism. Uh, today, she's going to be talking about the godless UN as a false solution to world peace. And uh, she's just coming, uh, emerging from an ordeal. She was just stuck for 10 minutes in the elevator trying to get down here. So be especially nice to her this morning. So we bring out Cornelia Ferrara. Thank you. Yes, a funny thing happened to me on the way to the conference. Your Excellencies, Reverend Fathers and Religious Ladies and Gentlemen, this talk is on the connection of the UN to Fatima, both of which present a message of peace. We will be looking at the United Nations through the eyes of Catholic faith and the message of Fatima. In his address to the UN on its 20th anniversary in 1965, Pope Paul VI said, our message is meant to be, first of all, a moral and solemn ratification of this lofty institution. This organization represents the obligatory path of modern civilization and of world peace. The peoples of the earth turn to the United Nations as the last hope of concord and peace. Well, after 66 years, the UN has produced no peace. Can it therefore be our only hope for peace? Unfortunately, the popes since its founding have increasingly thought so. The seeds of the church's dependency on the United Nations were sown when the international Christian order, Christendom, surrendered to the anti-Christian New World Order. As Father Brian Harrison explained in the English uh, periodical Christian Order, this tragic event occurred on November the 11th, 1918, when the armistice was signed after World War I and the Emperor Charles I of Austria-Hungary was forced to abdicate. He said the people had taken over and he hoped the emerging German-Austrian alliance would create and strengthen the new order. Now, according to the history books, the Holy Roman Empire was dissolved by Napoleon, a Freemason, in 1806. But, said Father Harrison, the church continued to recognize the Austrian emperor as inheriting the privileges of the Holy Roman Emperor, just like Russia has been accepted by the United Nations as inheriting the seat of the extinct Soviet Union. But on November the 11th, 1918, the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, Empire was finally dissolved and World War I removed the secular right arm of the church as the empire was called in church prayers. Its job had been to secure peace for the church and hence for the world. It had represented the unity of nations in the peace of Christ and under his kingship. In its place was substituted the Humanistic League of Nations and later the United Nations, which is the new international empire based on the rights of man instead of the sovereignty of Christ and the rights of God and his church. So important was the role of the emperor in the defense and temporal welfare of Christendom that he was allowed to veto a papal candidate. He was also prayed for in the church's official worship. In the Tridentine Mass prior to the time of Pius XII, there were prayers for the emperor on appropriate occasions. He was also included in the great litany of intercessions on Good Friday. These prayers continued until the 1950s, probably because it was believed that the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire in 1918 was only a temporary setback. And in fact, Pius XII tried unsuccessfully to set up a new Catholic state after World War II. Now, the prayers underline the fact that whereas in the past the church called on God for help, now she counts exclusively, almost exclusively, upon men and organizations that are inimical to God and to herself. For instance, 
The collect prayer of the mass called God, not the UN, the protector of all kingdoms and especially the Christian empire. The secret prayer asks God to help his arm, that is the emperor, to protect the faithful nations so that when the enemies of peace are defeated, Christian liberty may serve God in safety. Note the implication that the enemies of Christ's kingdom are the enemies of world peace. The church's liberty in belief, worship, and teaching is necessary for her to carry out her mandate of saving souls, which is how she serves God. The post-communion prayer asks God to furnish the Roman Empire and the Emperor with the armory of heaven, not the UN, so that the peace of the churches may remain undisturbed by the storms of war. The Good Friday intercession asks God to help the Emperor to civilize the world for the sake of our perpetual peace by bringing all barbarous nations under his authority. It also requested that those nations with trust in their ferocity may be restrained by the right arm of thy power, which is the Holy Roman Emperor. Unfortunately, the League of Nations and the United Nations were finally able to persuade the papacy that they, and not the old Christian Commonwealth, hold the key to world peace and unity. Now God knew that the church would lose her temporal defender in 1918, so he sent Our Lady to Fatima in 1917 to tell the church how to protect herself in the new world order and to obtain peace for the world. Peace in our times was entrusted to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and no one else. War, she said, is caused by sin. That is very important because that's not the thinking today. Peace will result only when her Immaculate Heart is venerated worldwide. And this requires, she said, the magisterial consecration of Russia and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. Otherwise, communist Russia will be an instrument of chastisement worldwide, spreading her errors, fomenting wars and persecutions of the church. On June the 13th, 1929, Our Lady told Sister Lucia that the moment had come for the consecration to be done. Now, Everything that heaven does has significance. It was in 1929 that Pope Pius XI thought the church was entering a glorious new era and new order. He was celebrating his sacerdotal jubilee and in his encyclical on December the 23rd of 1929, he listed the many political and spiritual graces of that year, the 75th anniversary of the proclamation of the Immaculate Conception. On February 11th, the date of Our Lady's appearance at Lourdes, the Vatican signed the Lateran Treaty with Italy, which recognized the full liberty and civil sovereignty of the Roman Pontiff. That treaty was ratified on the Feast of the Sacred Heart, June the 7th. And the Pope was very hopeful that it had the protection and approval of Jesus and Mary. He greatly rejoiced, he was almost euphoric, at signs of a diminishing persecution of the church around the world and a thriving of Catholic life. But heaven obviously did not consider this a time of complacency. Six days after the ratification of the Lateran Treaty, Our Lady, appearing with the Holy Trinity, said God wanted the Holy Father to consecrate Russia to her Immaculate Heart, to rescue Russia from its own persecution save souls and bring peace to the world. Why did she choose that? Because it was also in 1929 that Stalin started to mount a socialist offensive on all fronts and raised to the highest pitch the bloody terror and the horrors of the Gulag. But Our Lady and the Holy Trinity have been ignored to this day. Pius XII dropped the prayers for the Emperor. And from the time of John the 23rd, the church, the church seems to be operating under the belief that she has no more enemies and peace is only a matter of human rights, brotherhood, and respect for nature. So in Paul VI's new mass, the prayers said after the Tridentine low mass for the protection of the church were dropped. 
But Pius XII was wary of the UN. As late as 1957, he warned about the most powerful groups attempting to impose their world outlook on all mankind. He said, the final court of appeal for the decisions of a Christian must always be the will of Christ. John XXIII, however, greatly increased Catholic support for the UN. Paul VI, as I mentioned, ratified it as the obligatory path and the last hope of peace. John Paul I, in his first papal discourse, urged the world to work for a new order of greater justice and more stable peace, and he praised all the peace initiatives, but he said the tremendous spiritual power of the Catholic Church is the guarantee of peace and order. In 2003, Pope John Paul II stressed that international law, not God's law or Our Lady of Fatima's peace plan, but international law is a means to avoid war. On January 1, 2004, he made it clear that international law, also called the rule of law, supersedes the sovereignty of nations. He called for a new international order under a strengthened UN, which he wanted to go from being an administrative institution to a moral center for the world. We're talking about an organization composed of atheists and tyrants as the moral center of the world. Pope Benedict also supports the idea of a one world United Nations government and religion. In his address to the UN in 2008, he reinforced Pope John's belief in its being a moral center for a united world. Instead of the Ten Commandments, he called the Atheistic Declaration of Human Rights the fundamental nucleus of values. International laws and UN interventions are not attacks on national sovereignty, he said, and he commended the UN support of interfaith dialogue. To understand why the Church's hope for peace is terribly misplaced, we must study the history of the UN. And the trail leads us back to Illuminist Freemasonry, whose ultimate goal has always been to impose the worship of Lucifer through a one world government and religion. It's the continuation of Lucifer's revolt and his desire to rule the entire universe. And this is the goal of the United Nations organization. Pope Leo XIII's 1884 encyclical Humanum Genus details Masonry's plans for its universal socialist republic, a new world order that is opposed to the old Christian order. Also in the 19th century, English Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, Cardinal Newman, and Cardinal Manning all testified to the power of secret societies behind governments and behind communism. These secret forces and communism were directed by Freemasonry, said Pope Leo. By 1902, he had observed, Masonry had found its way into every class of society, forming an invisible and irresponsible power, an independent government, as it were, within the state. In other words, as recognized more than a century ago, elections are a sham because even elected leaders are controlled by a secret Masonic Illuminati cabal. Monarchies or autocratic leaders are a roadblock to this control and must be replaced if countries are to be part of the Masonic world order. In 1920, Pope Benedict XV characterized this order as follows. He called it, quote, a universal republic which is longed for by all the worst elements of disorder. From this republic, based on the principles of absolute equality of men and the community of possessions, would be banished all national distinctions, nor in it would the authority of the father over his children or of God over human society be any longer acknowledged. If these ideas are put into practice, he said, there will inevitably follow a reign of unheard of terror. Now, 
Voltaire wrote that in order to lead the masses into new subjection, the Illuminati must lie to them like the devil himself, boldly and always. He told his fellow Illuminists, we must make them lavish promises and use extravagant phrases. The opposite of what we promise may be done afterwards. That is of no consequence. This command to lie is quite clearly based on evidence, the mission statement of the United Nations. The UN's plan for peace is actually a plan for continuous war in order to manipulate the world into surrendering national sovereignties to a world authority. It was designed by Johann Ficht, a German mason with Illuminati connections who died in 1814. Ficht called for a League of Nations as a necessary step preceding world government, but it would come to fruition after enough wars had been deliberately manipulated to cause humanity to want peace at any price. The United Nations was founded according to Ficht's plan. Unending wars until all humanity, including the Catholic Church, accepts the rule of the one world Masonic government. Russia was the starting point. Winston Churchill revealed that Lenin was sent into Tsarist Russia to destroy it. With the help, he said, of the most formidable sect in the world, he worked with demoniacal ability to tear to pieces every institution on which the Russian state depended. Lenin and other communist leaders were Satanists. And so this is very significant when we consider the number of communist countries in the UN. It's probably safe to say that Our Lady of Fatima was not concerned about the economic policies of Russia, but about it spreading the kingdom of Satan on earth, the New Age movement, the New World Order. The two world wars didn't just happen. Johann Fichte influenced Hegel who devised a dialectic conflict between a synthesis and its antithesis, between, sorry, a thesis and its antithesis. The solution is a compromise synthesis of the opposing forces that advances the world government. And these steps are repeated until the goal is reached. Following the dialectical method at the end of the 19th century, Albert Pike, sovereign pontiff of universal Freemasonry, together with the Italian Illuminati leader, Massini, planned three world wars and a final cataclysm to be deliberately per perpetrated by the Illuminati in order to facilitate world government under the guise of peace. Hegel influenced both Marx and Hitler. The Illuminati funded Karl Marx, whose real name was Mordecai Mark Levy, to write the Communist Manifesto, which promotes Illuminati principles. The Illuminati plan was to control communism, Nazism, and political Zionism in order to facilitate dividing the world's population into opposing camps in ever increasing numbers so that they would eliminate each other. World War I was meant to advance communism and destroy Tsarist Russia. It happened. World War II was to be a clash between communism and its fabricated antithesis, fascism. It happened and advanced communism worldwide and into the Catholic Church. The Third World War is meant to pit Zionism against the Muslim world. We can already see Muslim terrorists and rebels being used as the new world enemy. In a final fourth step, a terrible conflict between the remaining communists and Christians will lead them to accept a one world government for peace. Then the Illuminati will usurp the powers of that government and impose their Luciferian king and ideology upon the remaining part of mankind. Using Hegel's dialectical method, the Bolshevik revolution and the building of the Soviet empire as well as Hitler and the Nazis, were all financed by European and American bankers associated with a secret society with Illuminati connections known as the Order of Skull and Bones. 
Major families associated with the order include the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, and many of America's elite, including the Bushes. President Bush Jr., his father, and his grandfather. His grandfather was a partner and director of banking firms that financed Hitler and the Soviets. The Order of Skull and Bones generated the League of Nations after World War I, which then became the United Nations after World War II. Interestingly, Britain issued a victory postage stamp in 1946 that featured Masonic symbols, thus proclaiming World War II a victory for the Masonic World Order. Regarding the 1991 Gulf War, as we know, President Bush Sr. said, for the first time since World War II, the international community is united. The leadership of the United Nations, once only a hoped for ideal, is now confirming its founder's vision. The world can therefore seize this opportunity to fulfill the long-held promise of a new world order. And that 1991 war certainly moved the world in that direction. Under his son, a third generation skull and bones man, the Muslim nations have been pushed towards World War III. A few days after 9-11, the Canadian Prime Minister Jean Chrétien remarked in New York, there will probably be a new order in the world that will probably be better than we have now. With the removal of uncooperative rulers in the Middle East and Africa, and with UN and NATO members fighting or fomenting revolutions, it seems we are already in an undeclared world war. As for North America, the Canadian Naval Commander William Carr said around 1957, quote, we will know the hour for subjugation has arrived when the President of the USA and the Prime Minister in Canada declare a state of emergency and set up a military dictatorship on the pretense that such action is necessary to protect the people from communist aggression. The communist parties in both our countries are being contained because the Illuminati intend to use them to bring about the state of emergency. When the communists are ordered to revolt, they will be allowed to run wild as they were in Russia. Then the agents of the Illuminati will appear and take over control under the pretense they are the saviors of the people. Revolution on behalf of the masses is the hallmark of masonry and communism. Since the alleged death of communism, it operates under disguise. Are the revolutionaries in the Middle East and Libya fomented by Facebook and Twitter and openly encouraged by Western governments as saviors of their people? Are they the new face of communism? In the free West, will Muslim terrorists be the disguise? The ex-KGB defector Anatoly Golitsyn, in his expose of the perestroika deception, said that the ex-Soviet Muslim republics were being used to replace pro-Western rulers in the Middle East with Russian-controlled Muslim fundamentalists, as well as to channel nuclear weapons and technology to Iran. Now let's look at the founding of the UN and its role in the Masonic plan. American President Woodrow Wilson's closest advisor was Edward Mandel House, an Illuminati agent. The US was dragged into World War I through a secret agreement of House. The provocation was the deliberate betrayal of the British ocean liner Lusitania with Americans on board to German U-boat destruction. At the end of the war, House got Wilson to propose Fick's idea, a League of Nations for World Peace. The League was partly funded by the Rockefellers and was a first step towards establishing the infrastructure of the world government. House, Wilson, and the Rockefellers were all associated with skull and bones. But the United States didn't join the League. And so in 1921, the Council on Foreign Relations, the CFR, 
was founded by the international bankers associated with Skull and Bones to lobby for American participation. The Illuminati Agent House was a founding member of the CFR, whose original membership was full of Bolshevik supporters. So this union of financiers and communists illustrates that communism and capitalism are not opposed. Similarly, left and right mean nothing to Masons. For instance, both Hitler and Stalin invaded Poland in 1939 in a joint pact. Both were financed by Western bankers. Communism and fascism are just systems of absolute state power descended from Hegel. So international bankers, whether or not they are communists themselves, happily use totalitarian regimes to facilitate their goal of totalitarian world government. The Council on Foreign Relations finally got the US to participate in world government through World War II. By then, the group controlled the State Department. Just two weeks after Pearl Harbor, which led America to war, the Secretary of State recommended to President Franklin D. Roosevelt that the Planning Committee of the United Nations be formed. It was stacked with CFR members. It was thus the communist-dominated Council on Foreign Relations, which was tied to the order of skull and bones, that founded the United Nations in 1945. The UN wasn't founded as a result of the war, but the war was used as a front for its founding, supposedly to prevent further wars, but actually to produce world government through war. The foundation for the UN was the Atlantic Charter drawn up by Churchill and Roosevelt on August the 14th, 1941. Its propaganda was that only Nazism was a menace to the world, and once it was defeated, there would be world peace. Ignoring the Bolshevik slaughter of their own citizens and the Soviet occupation since 1939 of many European countries in a genocidal rampage, especially against Catholics, Stalin was to be defended by the Western Allies once Hitler invaded Russia in June 1941. With breathtaking hypocrisy, the USSR and China signed the Anglo-American Atlantic Charter along with several other countries on January the 1st, 1942. And this core group of signers was called the United Nations. As per the terms of the Atlantic Charter, and you'll see why I talk about the hypocrisy of Russia and China which signed this. As per the terms of the Atlantic Charter, they agreed not to seek to increase their territories, to respect the rights of all peoples to choose the form of government under which to live, and to restore sovereign rights and self-government to those nations forcibly deprived of them. They also agreed that all nations had to abandon the use of force, and until a worldwide permanent system of security was established, these aggressive nations had to be disarmed. Those are the basic terms of the Atlantic Charter. The lying and warlike nature of the United Nations can be seen from this date, as the bloody communization of the world would proceed unhindered under its auspices in contradiction of the Atlantic Charter. So it was obvious that its own rules mean nothing to the United Nations. It was following Voltaire. Make lavish promises, and if you do the opposite, so what? Roosevelt, a 33rd degree Mason and close associate of the, U of the CFR, wanted to join Stalin in the war, but several American bishops spoke out against it. They knew that if the Allies won, it would strengthen communist expansion. And they were obeying Pius XI, who in 1937 taught in his encyclical Divini Redemptoris, communism is intrinsically perverse, and no one who would save Christian civilization may collaborate with it in any undertaking whatsoever. 
so it made no sense to cooperate with the church's enemy in order to preserve Christian civilization. However, the American Cardinal Spellman, Roosevelt, and the Vatican's Undersecretary for Ordinary Affairs, Monsignor Montini, the future Paul VI, pressured Pius XII to authorize a wider interpretation of Divini Ridem Torres. On September the 20th, 1941, Pius XII lifted all objections against American aid to Russia. Catholics could now support Roosevelt and Stalin, and the stage was set for the planned war between fascism and communism. But like World War I, an excuse was needed for the US to enter World War II. On December the 7th, just two and a half months after Pius gave the green light, Pearl Harbor was bombed. Three naval admirals and others have described how high government officials, including Churchill and Roosevelt, provoked the Japanese attack, knew when it was coming, and did nothing to prevent it. The establishment of world government depends on the cooperation of the United States and the Catholic Church with communism. Roosevelt and his personal propagandist to the Vatican, the Freemason Myron Taylor, worked hard to persuade Pope Pius that Stalin was in a just war with Christian allies against Hitler. And that because Russia signed the Atlantic Charter, its membership in the peace-loving United Nations needed to be encouraged. Now, Our Lady of Fatima had promised a period of world peace through the consecration of Russia. Incredibly, Roosevelt promised the Pope and American bishops lasting peace through cooperation with Russia. He also promised what would basically be a new United Nations Christendom. Peace will come, he said, and an international order in which the spirit of Christ will rule the hearts of men and nations. This is what he said to the Pope and the American bishops. So in September 1942, Pius XII admitted, at the request of President Roosevelt, the Vatican has refrained from all polemics against the communist regime. May God grant that the free world may not have to regret my silence one day. Later, the Pope spoke out against communism, but his permission to cooperate with Stalin and his silence had opened the door to communist penetration of the church, either directly or through the UN. Unfortunately, Pius also committed the church to support decolonization, which was vital to Moscow's plans of worldwide expansion. In 1920, Stalin had called for the secession of India, Arabia, Egypt, and other colonized countries because secession would mean a weakening of the position of imperialism and a strengthening of the position of revolution. The Good Friday prayers for the Holy Roman Emperor, which Pius XII removed, were prayers for the civilizing expansion of Christianity. But this civilizing action now became excoriated as the crime of colonialism. John XXIII completed the church's disavowal of colonialism in his encyclical Pachim in Terras. And the Vatican ignored the savage nature of decolonization in which the UN aided Russia. The UN so-called peacekeeping actions, which today are carried out as humanitarian interventions, turned Christian European colonies in Africa over to the communists. The UN opens the doors to communism was a common saying in the Congo. A communist pamphlet titled The United Nations and printed in India explained, the UN will be an extremely helpful instrument in breaking up the colonial territories of non-communist countries and will eventually bring about the amalgamation of all nations into a single Soviet system. Then in 1962, as we know, the Vatican-Moscow agreement on Catholic silence about communism ensured the expansion of the satanic New World Order. 
a former member of the United States Communist Party, testified that the UN's Kremlin masterminds never intended the UN as a peacekeeping organization. He said it has been communist designed for sociological conquest. It's a Trojan horse whose aim is communist penetration of the West. In fact, the UN blueprint was drawn up by Lenin, expanded by Stalin, and refined by Khrushchev. Communists have openly asserted that the UN is one of the most important platforms of Soviet propaganda from which they may preach to the populations of the entire world over the heads of their governments. And it was the Soviets who insisted that the UN headquarters should be in the United States, because from here their spies, posing as delegates or staff, could infiltrate American society. J. Edgar Hoover, the former head of the FBI and a 33rd degree Mason, stated that the communist diplomats assigned to the United Nations represent the backbone of Russian intelligence operations in this country. A former leader of the United States Communist Party acknowledged that American communists, many of whom were government figures, also had a major hand in the planning and creation of the UN. The chairman of a Senate investigation committee stated, quote, there is today in the UN among the American employees there the greatest concentration of communists that this committee has ever encountered. Almost all have been employees in the US government in high and sensitive positions. The committee believed the government knew they were communists and deliberately transferred them to the UN. Alger Hiss, a known Soviet spy and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, was an advisor to Roosevelt. He was also the Secretary General of the conference that officially founded the UN at San Francisco in 1945, and he helped to write the UN Charter. Another known key agent was Harry Dexter White, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury Department. With Mason Harry Truman's support, he helped to establish the United Nations International Monetary Fund. The IMF is the framework for a global bank of issue of a world currency, which will result in world government. The IMF and its sister UN agency, the World Bank, are CFR, that is Illuminati creations. Under the guise of humanitarian aid, the World Bank loans mainly American tax dollars to spread socialism and communism. The UN Secretary Generals have always considered themselves citizens of the world, not of the country from which they come. They don't have loyalty to those countries. Furthermore, in 1952, an American journal stated that as many as one half of the administrative executives in the UN are either communists or people willing to do what they want. In 1955, an American former communist publicly admitted Communists control the UN. Most of the UN special agencies are in fact operated by them. So how can one say that communism is dead if the world's governing authority is a personification of communism? The vast number of UN special agencies like UNICEF, the World Health Organization, UNESCO, the United Nations World Population Fund, the treaties, the conventions that give family destroying rights to children and feminists, the United Religions Organization, and all the so-called peacekeeping actions, all these entities are completely communistic. Here are three quick examples. The first head of the World Health Organization called for the eradication of the concept of right and wrong in the education of children in order to change human behavior. The United Religions Organization is the institution of the UN's atheistic occult one world religion. It was co-founded by the Marxist-Leninist Mikhail Gorbachev, who wishes to reduce the population of the earth by 90%. UNESCO was founded on the vision of world government and eugenics. As we know, communism has perpetrated huge death and destruction. Its policies have broken millions of families and destroyed homes and countries, and it continues unchecked, just wearing different costumes. By peace, 
The UN means the communist base in which all opposition is eliminated, as admitted by former UN Secretary General Yutant himself. He stated that Lenin's ideals of peace and peaceful coexistence are in line with the aims of the UN Charter. Before its finalization of the Charter, an American senator had predicted, the adoption of the UN Charter will mean perpetuating war. Between 2006 and 2007, there was a 15% increase in UN troops. Today, nearly 100,000 UN troops from 114 nations are serving in 14 countries. As George Orwell warned in his book 1984, if we wish to live in peace, we must love Big Brother. And the slogan he said at that time would be, war is peace whilst the Ministry of Peace would concern itself with war. The UN's Department of Peacekeeping Operations could be considered its Ministry of Peace. Today, what are called peacekeeping forces are in many instances waging war under the new job description of peacemaking. Indeed, Time Magazine calls UN troops armies of peace. But the UN's propaganda machine and media control fools the whole world. In 1961, Adlai Stevenson, the American ambassador to the United Nations and head of the Council on Foreign Relations, instructed the UN press corps to lie and paint a flattering picture of UN intentions. Now, besides the God of Peace, the God of Human Rights is also invoked to facilitate the United Nations agenda. The UN's Declaration of Human Rights is accorded a higher status in the Ten Commandments. But the dissident priest Hans Kung has admitted that it's descended from the Masonic French Revolution. And the 18th century historian of the Illuminati roots of the French Revolution, Professor John Robeson, said that the Illuminati intended to root out all religion and morality to establish the imprescriptible rights of man that is, rights that cannot be legally taken away. So Freemasonry, the leader of the city of Satan, seeks to establish the rights of man in opposition to the rights of God. That is, the primacy of man over God. Or seen another way, the rights of man as God. In 1859, Cardinal P re reprimanded Napoleon III for continuing the principles of the French Revolution, saying, quote, The social teaching which inspires the state is a true declaration of the rights of man, sire, which is nothing more than a formal denial of the rights of God. It is the right of God to command states as well as individuals. It is for this that Christ came on earth. He must reign ruling the activities of governments and the governed. Unless Jesus Christ can exercise his power, there is disorder and decadence." End of quote. However, the Declaration of Human Rights has been lauded by Popes John XXIII and John Paul II. And Pope Benedict XVI says the Declaration, not the Decalogue, is the fundamental nucleus of values and hence of rights even though there's no right to life for unborn babies in there. John the 23rd gave a hint, however, of why this declaration is important. He said it represents an important step on the path towards the juridical political organization of all the peoples of the world. That's the point. The Declaration of Human Rights is the foundation of international laws for a world government that will be completely inimicable to the rights of God and his church. Not surprising because that declaration closely parallels the Soviet constitution. It's a blueprint for tyranny. The basic Marxist plank in the declaration and the Soviet constitution is that man's material well-being is all important. His privacy and freedom are secondary considerations. 
So governments must take full responsibility for the welfare of the people and control all their activities. A United Nations covenant is enforceable legislation once ratified and it overrides a country's constitution. Further, nearly every high sounding phrase such as the rights to freedom of expression or of religion can be legally denied by governments or the UN if they believe it's necessary to protect national security, public safety, the rights of others, etc., etc. For instance, the Masonic French Revolution was per perpetrated in the name of public safety and Hitler's atrocities in the name of national security. And today we all know democratic countries are rapidly losing their rights in the name of national security and public safety thanks to the war on terror. And freedom of religion, such as freedom to protest same-sex marriages, is also being erased in the name of minority rights. So even if the Soviet Union has officially collapsed, Soviet Russia's ideology lives on in the human rights and other UN documents. And this is signified by the UN insignia itself, which is designed by an American communist to resemble that of the Soviet Union. UN military interventions are carried out to supposedly defend human rights. But the rights of government are ignored where sedition has been fomented and the government fights back. Then the UN interferes, claiming it's ending government aggression against its own people. By its own definition, a United Nations military action is not aggression. UN and NATO actions against sovereign states that do not cooperate with the new world order are called police action. And humanitarian intervention after enough violent chaos has been fomented to hopefully justify genocidal international force. And I'll give you an example for in the Serbian province of Kosovo. Starting in 1998, the American CIA and the British Special Armed Services armed and trained the Albanian Kosovo Liberation Army, the KLA, to foment armed rebellion in its, bed, in its bid to separate from the Yugoslavian province of Serbia. Around 1993, the US had classified this Marxist KLA as a terrorist organization financed by heroin trafficking from Afghanistan via NATO member Turkey into Europe. And it bought its weapons with that money from Italy, Switzerland, Turkey, and other countries. The KLA was also known to be receiving money and training from Osama bin Laden and from Al-Qaeda. But after it started working for the US, it was removed from the terrorist list. Serb leader Slobodan Milosevic tried to deter to stop this KLA operation for the drug trade, so he had to go. And after bombing Yugoslavia into uh, submission in 1999, NATO then stood by and allowed the KLA to ethnically cleanse the non-Albanians from Kosovo and form its new government. The Albanians went on to raise, to destroy, more than 150 churches and monasteries to remove all semblance of Christian heritage. And the Libyan action that we are seeing today is very similar to what took place in Kosovo. There is a long list, a sorry list, of the UN and NATO either ignoring or aiding the breaking of human rights in many countries. The Canadian ambassador to Yugoslavia from 1990 to 1992 stated that their actions have been marked by duplicity and double standards. Now NATO is actually a United Nations regional organization meant to strengthen the UN and move us in the direction of one world. It's a communist ally and an agent of communist expansion. And its anti-communist stance during the war, Cold War, was simply posturing. Stalin saw the necessity of regional groups as an intermediate stage to world government. And he figured that people would transfer national loyalties more easily to these regional groups than to a big world authority. 
And then later on, these regional groups could be combined into the world dictatorship. So the organization of American states and its African equivalent are also UN regional groups. In 1963, President Kennedy advocated global socialism and control through the UN and NATO. Then Russia eventually became a NATO partner in 2002. Why? To fight the common enemy of global terrorism. Now, because China and Russia conveniently vetoed the UN action in Kosovo, NATO set a new precedent of using the Declaration of Human Rights in order to avert a humanitarian tragedy, as it was called. This precedent means that NATO, as a military extension of the UN, will now intervene anywhere in the world. It's now in Afghanistan, where the opium trade is thriving after the defeat of the anti-communist Taliban. And as mentioned earlier, NATO member Turkey has been helping the Albanian terrorists in supplying heroin from Afghanistan to Europe and the USA through the Balkans. And now, as we know, NATO's involved in Libya. Now let's look very briefly at a few other UN groups. Let's start with UNESCO, the UN's educational, scientific, and cultural organization whose constitution was written by a member of Skull and Bones. The Vatican has supported this organization since 1952. In 2002, Pope John, Pope John Paul appealed to UNESCO to build bridges through the formation of consciences to avoid wars. But UNESCO spreads the error of Russia through education and culture. Communists themselves have explained that UNESCO corresponds to the agitation and propaganda department in the Communist Party getting at the public mind, young and old. The anti-life UNESCO is at the forefront of the environmental movement, and it's involved in getting together the occult one world, culture, and religion. It has also been working to revise Christian teaching, especially the story of the crucifixion, so as to reduce the danger of implanting, this is a quote, reduce the danger of implanting anti-Semitism in the minds of the young. And in the 1950s, it was praised by the American Jewish Committee for revising textbooks originally prejudicial to one or another racial, religious, or ethnic group. Interestingly, the Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion was reported in Time Magazine August 16, 1948 as saying, we consider that the United Nations ideal is a Jewish ideal. UNESCO's World Heritage Convention is a blatant property grab and a danger for the church. Through this convention, the church is losing control of her physical and cultural heritage, her ancient churches, her artwork, and so forth. The convention postulates that there are some natural and man-made sites which are not the national heritage of a particular country, but of the world, because they have universal value. They belong to the world. There are 911, 9-11 World Heritage, funny number, but there it is, 911 present World Heritage sites, and they include natural wonders like the Grand Canyon, sites of pagan rites like Stonehenge, monuments, ancient temples, Catholic churches, many Catholic churches like Chartres Cathedral, and even Auschwitz concentration camp. These sites allegedly further universal ideas that unite people such as evolution or a past way of life or some past culture. In other words, they promote the pantheistic one world culture. The World Heritage Convention stipulates that the protection of these sites is the responsibility of all mankind. Countries that ratify the convention pledge to conserve these sites for future generations. In return, the international community helps them to protect these marvels. What does that mean? It means that the UN can dictate how the site is used for what is called sustainable tourism. Signatories contribute an obligatory amount to the World Heritage Fund. The Holy See signed on October the 7th, 1982 
turning over the entire site of the Vatican to UNESCO control, which can then affect rules for opening, closing, maintenance, even what's sold in the religious shops. Also, the historic center of Rome, including St. John Lateran, St. Mary Major, and St. Paul outside the walls, which I think now has an ecumenical chapel, all of these are World Heritage properties. Now, in the religious sphere, communism is manifested as pantheism. What is pantheism? It's atheism, because it denies the existence of God when it makes the universe God. Further, it parallels political collectivism by absorbing the individual into the universal collective divine community. Pantheism and collectivism are the two prongs of Illuminism and Communism. So the spread of pantheism in the church through the movements for ecumenism, syncretism, and universal brotherhood is nothing else but the spread of communism and masonry. Cardinal Newman warned of the spread of pantheism, the great deceit which awaits the age to come. That is our times. Sister Lucy observed, we are living in a time of diabolical disorientation, practically the same words, which is literally confusion coming from the devil. And she warned us not to be deceived. Remember Cardinal Newman said, the great deceit. The League of Nations itself was associated with occult Russian theosophy, which is a branch of masonry whose pantheistic occultism is the foundation of the one world religion. The League's successor, the United Nations, is uniting the world's religions into this one world religion that was predicted by Pope Pius X in his condemnation of the Sion movement more than a hundred years ago. For all its talk on religious freedom, the UN intends everyone to practice its occult spirituality and they will be monitored for compliance. The syncretic services held everywhere today with government officials involved are the liturgical rites of the pantheistic one world religion which is nothing else than the worship of Satan. Separation of church and state no longer applies when the church is masonry. Environmentalism, color it red. It's the new communism. Because its laws to protect the allegedly fragile earth are advancing totalitarianism, whilst all these prognostications of imminent disaster, just like the specter of nuclear war, which was hammered uh, a few years ago, all these are, pro are seen to be problems requiring world government for solutions. The Marxist Gorbachev is an important leader in this new environmental field. A very strong part of the UN's pantheism is pagan environmentalism. It sees humanity itself as a danger to the earth. Gorbachev wants to reduce it by 90%. There's presently a move to formulate human rights for the earth, which is worshipped as a living entity, a goddess, Mother Earth, Gaia, Earth Day, celebrated on Lenin's birthday, April the 22nd, has now been designated by the UN General Assembly as International Mother Earth Day. And the UN is planning a declaration on the rights of Mother Earth. Bolivia is at the forefront of this. It wants a UN treaty based on its own law, providing rights for Mother Earth and 10 commandments to save the planet, beginning with ending capitalism. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child makes it an offense for parents to teach their children reverence for their religion as this fosters religious discrimination. And parents cannot object to multicultural indoctrination of children even in Catholic schools as this could be interpreted as child abuse under Article 14 which guarantees religious freedom for children. Feminism, another major error of Russia. Most of its tenets are derived from communism and the Soviet state. So the UN has long promoted women's rights, which are destructive of the family, the faith, and Christian morality. All United Nations agencies are working to strengthen the UN and spread its totalitarian agenda into every sphere of life. 
People are won over by self-interest, as the UN is painted as a big problem solver and the guarantor of an earthly paradise. This talk has only touched the surface of how the United Nations is spreading all the errors of Russia. Our Lady of Fatima said, Russia is God's chosen instrument of chastisement of the world and the church. The UN has every nation and even the Catholic Church under its control to some degree. Once all militaries and weapons are under UN control, it will be a full dictatorship. President Kennedy said, disarmament would create a radically new international system. It would encourage nations to give up much of their sovereignty. Their national security would depend on an international peace force under an immensely strengthened United Nations. Notice our recent calls always seem to lead to the recent action uh, in some country. Wars have led to the call for UN peacekeepers. So the UN is strengthened as the fighting forces of more and more countries come under its control, shifting their loyalties from their nation to the world. Furthermore, participation in UN wars greatly strain the militaries and financial resources of nations, thus weakening them and causing social stress. The propaganda that communism is dead is the greatest deception ever foisted on a world desperate for peace. It is a diabolical disorientation. In these times of diabolical disorientation, said Sister Lucy, the devil has succeeded in infiltrating evil under cover of good. This describes the UN to a T. She added, souls are letting themselves be deceived. We must defend souls against the errors which may make them stray from the good road. She was actually repeating the words of Pius XII in a 1945 speech about communist infiltration in the church being aided by misled Catholics. The UN is keeping communism alive. Pope Pius XI said, we may not cooperate with communism, and therefore the UN, in any way, if we are to save Christian civilization. 66 years after the UN was founded for peace, we live amongst the ruins of Christian civilization. We are facing a third world war and a slaughter that had been pre-planned for the establishment of the kingdom of Satan on earth. The message of Fatima is clear. Depend on God, not man, for peace. God has entrusted peace in our day only to Mary. Why? Perhaps because, as St. John Eudes taught, the hearts of Jesus and Mary are so united that they can be considered one heart. Hence, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart automatically means the restoration of the kingship of Christ. And that means peace. As expressed in this traditional prayer, Jesus, King and center of all hearts, through the advent of thy kingdom, grant us peace. That's why the devil has worked against the consecration of Russia. It will restore the social kingship of Christ over the world. That's why implying the diabolical disorientation would greatly affect the ministers of the church, Sister Lucy exclaimed, Gladly I sacrifice myself and offer my life to God for peace in his church, for priests, and for all consecrated souls, especially for those who are so deceived and misled. Can we, in charity, do any less than this humble messenger chosen by heaven? Thank you.